just wandering around this complex, it's um, in the last 24 hours, and it's, it's not long before you bump into heroes of the faith, those fighting cancers and other traumatic illnesses, people battling huge disappointments and yet holding on to hope. And unless you know, it's hard to know sometimes because of the radiance of the joy that comes out of their smile. Think of one lady. She's in the room. Her name is Louise. She's the best deacon I've ever known. And she's fighting and battling cancer. But you wouldn't know because when you're with her, there's a mission heart that comes out of her life. A joy, a brightness. There's a smile that only Jesus can give. Other people also suffering lots of different things. And these last two years, it's been difficult for everyone. And, and for some, it's been the worst of times. And if as a minister, you've ever thought of jacking it in, then you've thought about it in the last two years. Because it's, it's been difficult to, to navigate and, and, and be strong and lead your church through times that you haven't got a clue what's happening. And we all discovered all kinds of things. And of course, we discovered Zoom and uh, the ability to mute people <laughs> that we'd always dreamed of. For two years, the world only saw our top half. <laughs> it was a joy. And our buildings were empty for long periods of time and programs and those groups that you just wanted to shut down for years. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> All we need to make sure now is that we don't open them up again. And we discovered the bittersweet relationship of lockdown. And I noticed something. I noticed um, that after a while, during that two years, the phone calls changed. The, the phone calls, Paul, um, we've just done our hundredth update of the risk assessment. <laughs> Remember those risk assessments? <laughs> um, would you like to check it for me? Oh, yes, thank you. I'd love to do that. <laughs> what a joy. Um, Paul, it's Saturday night. I've just caught COVID. What do I do tomorrow? I don't know. <laughs> Those phone calls changed. Something beautiful began to happen. And not just to a few isolated churches. I'm here this morning to tell you across the whole Elam movement, I, I do not know a church where God is not doing something. And stories started to emerge and we discovered that God was not on mute, God was not masked, God was not socially distant, and God was always and has always been and is still, even in lockdown, on mission. And we began to hear wonderful stories emerge. And, uh, and I received an email from one young pastor, and the general superintendent referred to it last night in his message, uh, but then appropriated it to, to another regional leader, but it was my region. <laughs> but I forgave him. It's okay. So I, I'm claiming it back now. One, one, one young pastor uh, called me and said, we have not had a baptism for 10 years. We're just coming back from lockdown and we're, we're having our very first 
baptism. Friends, when you've not had a baptism for 10 years, that's significant and that is a move of God and you know that God is doing something in that local church. He said to me that during the lockdown, we gathered more people have attached to our church online and people have been getting saved online. So now when we're going back into our church, we're just opening the church again, the original people are less than the ones that we've gained online coming into the building. I mean, that's amazing. Churches have had to move out of the buildings and find bigger venues. Scores, I mean, literally scores of people are finding salvation and we've had healing stories continually. And there are reports of constantly of the baptism of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon our churches. It is definitely happening. Despite the tiredness and the mental health strain and the many battles, it's felt a little bit like the 72 returning to Jesus with joy and saying, Lord, even the demons, even the demons, they submit to us in your name. And it's not hard to imagine the disciples' joy and their laughter and just this whole exuberance and noise filling base camp as they tell Jesus. And Jesus joining in that joy as well and saying, as he beams at the disciples and saying, you know what, guys, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's not hard to imagine that because it feels like we are under the smile of God as Elam. So we're gonna tell you some stories. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And I'm gonna invite the missions training coordinator, Danny Face, who's gonna come and interview some of these incredible stories. Thank you, Danny. Hello. I mean, I'm assuming you're there. I now can't see anyone from up here. Um, it is so exciting to be here with you today. Thank you, Paul. I am, um, this session just brings so much joy to my heart. If we had more time, I would love to spend hours just interviewing each of you and hearing what God has done in each of your churches, because we could do that and we could fill all of the Elam Leaders Summit, but we've got so many amazing teachings we need to get through as well, and there's such a feast to enjoy. So what we're going to do is we've asked a few people to join us and share their stories of what's been happening and how those stories really promote Elam's four priorities. So to start with, we're going to look at making disciples. And so I'm going to ask Lee and Fee Tribucci if you would come and join me on the stage. Let's welcome them as they come up. There you are. All right, now they've got such short time periods and everyone could speak for so long because there's so much to say. But would you mind please sharing with us about missional community? What are you doing? You're making disciples. What does it look like? Fill us in. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, God gave us a vision in 2009 um, to church plant and what that church could look like. Um, and then fast forward a little bit, we were at Regents um, Theological College and we met Darren and Jackie Johnson. Um, and they were speaking about missional communities. And we thought, yes, that's it. That's what God showed us. So we were then massively privileged to be able to go and spend three years with them at King's Church, Warrington, before returning to Leighton Buzzard um, to plant Spirit and Truth Church there. And that was in 2015. Um, so what's a missional community? Well, really, it's a vehicle for discipleship and mission. Um, the aim is to create authentic community and to help people within that community to really develop and grow in their relationship with God, so their up relationship, their relationship with others in the community and the church, so they're in relationships, but also with those that don't yet know and follow Jesus outside the community and the church, so an out relationship as well. Um, each missional community has a really clearly defined missional vision. And the real bonus of that is um, by being sort of intentional and um, yeah, keeping that the focus is it stops the community kind of becoming inward focused or maybe losing momentum, even if the intentions are good to start with. So um, 
Even though we've been planted for six years now, we still feel like we're quite early in our journey of missional communities. Um, and particularly with COVID, as I'm sure many of you can relate, it almost feels like we're starting again in many ways. Um, but when we started, we were literally um, six of us. So we were very small and two of those were children. So um, we called our small groups um, cell groups. Um, and they worked quite well. There was a lot of initial enthusiasm, but we found that there was sporadic attendance and it was really hard to sort of get continuity and momentum going. So we then, um, a couple of years later, um, decided to go for Connect Communities and they were a lot more effective at building community and that was really great, but they were still lacking that missional zeal that we were really after. Um, so we did a bit of um, teaching and vision sharing and we launched, launched four missional communities. Um, and, but you'll be pleased to know they do have individual names, so we don't always have to use the term missional community. So one of our missional communities is called The Orchard, and there's two small groups that make, that, make up that missional community, and there's a, a rhythm that will go through, but every month they will look to eat together, and then after that we'll go out prayer walking just to try and encounter people on the estate, and, and it's great when everyone comes back and just shares the exciting stories uh, that take place. Um, but with regards to that as well, we've, we've done some surveying after uh, lockdown and some of the, some of the community in a, a regional area that, that we're prayer walking said, we'd love just to meet, and there is a slightly older community, so we've started a needles and natter uh, of all things, so naturally I step back from that. Um, and uh, let, let them run with that. So that's great. And obviously the aim is to share the gospel. So just a very quick story. Our next door neighbor, um, we, she came along to one of our baptisms and she was so taken aback, she started crying. Um, and afterwards when we caught up with her, she said to us, oh, I don't know what was going on, but I just could not stop crying. So of course we just smiled because we knew it was the Holy Spirit at work. And we just encouraged her and talked her through. And then a little while later, she gave her life to Jesus. We had the privilege of baptizing her, which was amazing. But not only that, her husband then, um, he really is a person of peace for us. He hasn't made a commitment yet. But, you know, he is just someone who is so servant-hearted. And he's helped us put on many events now. He's provided equipment. And likewise, he invited one of his friends along to help us with the barbecue. He then gave his life to Jesus, and we ended up baptizing him, which is fantastic. Um, and roll forward a couple of years, we've now baptized their children, um, which is just amazing. Amen. Come on, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very, very much, guys. Thank you. What I love about that is that people are coming back and bringing the stories, because stories build expectation. They build faith, and it's such an important part of our journey in discipleship. So talking of stories, next up, I'm going to invite Ore Adanyamu to come and join us. Let's give him a big round of applause as he comes up. Thanks, Ore. Now, I'm really glad that Ore is here with me today. He's at City Gates Church in Ilford, but he was a part of the Missionary Apprenticeship Program many years ago. So I'm really glad to see that he's here and he's now doing it. So do you want to share with us, Ore, what does it look like in your context? Because I think you're doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring as part of discipleship. So please share what's going on. Yeah, cool. So um, as a youth and young adults pastor, I get um, a lot of opportunities just to, yeah, do one-to-one -one, uh, mentorship. Uh, which is really cool. Um, an, an example of that, uh, recently, uh, a kid who joined us uh, during lockdown whilst we were on Zoom, um, really enjoyed the sessions and then uh, came and joined us in person when we started meeting in person again. He actually would come early every session whilst I was still setting up and just follow me around and just talk to me about um, all the stuff that was going on, on in his life. And uh, admittedly, at first, I found it quite irritating because I was like, I've got stuff to do. <laughs> Um, but then I, I, I guess prompted by the Holy Spirit, I was like, this is actually an opportunity to invest in uh, a young person. And so now it's more of an intentional uh, mentorship relationship that we have. And um, he yeah, has been through a, a few different difficult situations that I've been able to kind of, I guess, coach him through. And then he doesn't listen to anything I say um, and then comes back and said, I didn't listen and it went wrong. And I'm like, I told you so. Um, <laughs> Um, but it is, um, I guess, not as, doesn't have the same instant gratification as um, loads of young people in uh, a big room, but um, it is slow and uh, sometimes frustrating work. But 
really uh, privileged to be able to see the fruit of God working um, in his life, of him, uh, yeah, just seeing more and more um, how uh, Jesus wants to use him. He's um, expressed a desire to, to go into ministry as well, which is really cool. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a, a really privileged opportunity to just get to invest in. That's just one person, but just think, get to invest in um, people's lives. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And I love your honesty as well, because it's so true. We all have those. Well, I definitely have those thoughts. But so I love it because that is part of our journey, isn't it? Um, so next, we're going to move on to growing churches as the next Eden priority. And for that, I'm going to invite up Clyde Thomas, who is at Qumran. Let's give him a massive round of applause as he joins us. Now, Clyde, I don't know how you are going to fit this into three minutes because there has been a lot going on. Fill us in. Over to you. So I guess if there was one scripture that sums up our local church community, it'd be this. Proverbs 14, verse 4. Where there are no oxen, the stable is clean. Where there are no oxen, the stable is clean. And you know, I'm sure we can all identify in the room that ministry is messy. And actually, you've got to see it before you see it if you're ever going to see it. And sometimes I think we look at our communities and we think, you know, where, where are the people? How are we going to reach this community? Or we say things like, oh, this is hard ground. But really, there's no hard ground. There are just people. And people are all the same. They have needs. And uh, so when we, when we think about mission, when we think about the heartbeat of mission and what all of us in this room want to carry to our communities, I think the best lesson I ever had was around 10, 12 years ago. My wife and I were ministering in a high-rise block of flats in Sheffield. And uh, we'd managed to reach a couple for Jesus and we were discipling them every Saturday. And uh, one time this person came up the stairs into this temporary accommodation block and called us down into a flat below. And we walked into that flat and I can only describe this horror scene that we encountered. There was a guy in the middle of the room, he was screaming, he was covered in scars, he had alcohol all around him, and he was on a urine-stained mattress. And I remember being there, and in that moment, the stench, the pain, my wife at the time, we were, we were there, and we were just like both looking at each other, oh my goodness, this is, I mean, I've encountered some things, but this was another level. And I remember the Holy Spirit just speaking to us and saying, if you don't get down on that mattress with him, don't ever do mission for me again. It was so clear. And as we sat on that mattress, we were able to bring some calm to the storm. And you know what's amazing? As we've done mission, I'm sure as you have too, through this difficult and challenging season, we've seen Jesus bring peace to the most amazing places and communities. We've planted new communities, new churches. And actually James, James Hackett, you know him, right? So he, um, he came to us like five years ago. He came into our rehab program. And uh, he has just stepped on now from leading a church plant that started during lockdown. And uh, yeah, the church plant has grown and it's significantly grown and people are being reached and saved in that community. And it's the sort of place that you've never heard of. Now, I guarantee you that the majority of the room have never heard of this place. Sovereign. Everyone say Sovereign. Sovereign. There's one street in and one street out. It's the sort of place that you're never going to think of, of planting a church. But we got word that the church had closed down. There was no witness in that community. So we just thought, well, we've got to do something. James, incidentally, five years ago, was outside boots, sleeping in a sleeping bag. And uh, as he was sleeping in the sleeping bag, the council sent him an eviction notice. I think he's like one of the only homeless people to be evicted. <laughs> so he ended up in Wales. <laughs> and, uh, and God has transformed his life. And he's just now planted church, been through rehab, and seeing the kingdom come. But you know what? It's messy. It is messy. And I just encourage everyone in the room, you know, encourage yourself with the stories. You know, we are shaped by stories. And if you don't see it, then who will? If you don't see the hope of Jesus for your street, then who will? You've got to see it before you see it if you're ever going to see it. Amen. Thank you. James is an incredible young man. 
Um, I had the honor of meeting him because he went through Regent Theological College as a student. He did the undergraduate course, um, and then he joined with Elam Missions as well. And he went and served overseas and did some mission trips as part of his discipleship and serving overseas. So just as Clyde has shared with us so beautifully, what's the vision for your community? What's the vision for where you are? Who could you reach out to? What does it look like for you to get down on that urine stain mattress? Where is that in your context? Who can you join with? And maybe it's overseas as well. But we'll get to overseas in a minute. But before we do, I'd like to invite Simon Woodward, who has been serving here in the UK. Let's give him a massive welcome. <laughs> there you are, Simon. So you've got a lot Cheers, of stories Simon. to share. So I'm just going to hand straight over to you. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Morning. Um, yeah, so just some context uh, for, for where we're doing church. So I'm at Wolverhampton. Um, and we planted that church in lockdown in the midst of the pandemic. Um, Wolverhampton was the largest city where there wasn't an Elim church, but that's changed now because there is an Elim church. And this started, uh, in, it's a regional plant, and this started in January uh, just last year. And we were in complete lockdown for the first three months. We couldn't go even into the city. We were just going in and, and checking the building and all of that. And, you know, in that delay, there was some frustration, I'm being honest. But then I felt the, the Holy Spirit say, don't get frustrated in the delay, get prepared in it. That's a word for us all when there's frustration. There's some preparation that God always wants to do. And then I felt the Holy Spirit say to us, as we had time um, to look around the city, to invest into the city, the best way to, to reach the city is to serve the city. I really felt the Holy Spirit say that. And then to bring healing to the city, we need to love the city. And like I said, we had an opportunity to do that. And we looked around and we looked at partnerships, you know, we could, organizations we could partner with to, to bring that uh, healing uh, and love. Uh, and two of those, um, one is a, a women's refuge. There are hundreds uh, of women in our area that have had to flee from domestic violence with children. And we've put on a, a number of uh, events now where the children have come uh, and the mothers have come. We've, we're just organizing a, a summer ball uh, where these ladies are going to get dressed up. They're going to do, do all this. But these children have had a terrible example of, of a father experience. Guys, we want to introduce them to the perfect father experience. And we're getting many of these kids uh, wanna come and, uh, and they're coming back now. Uh, and some of those uh, women now and children are based in our church uh, and they've given their life to Jesus, which is just uh, incredible. Um, un unusual for a city church, we've got a, a massive uh, kids work going on. Uh, children from like five to 10, we're inundated with these children and it's amazing to, to see. And just one recent story, it happened Sunday. Um, we put on an Easter event for, for, for these children uh, uh, f from uh, the, the Haven, uh, the, 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 the domestic violence uh, uh, partnership. Um, and many of those children come, but a lady in a church brought her granddaughter. Uh, and she absolutely loved it. And she's been coming every uh, week since uh, Easter, every Sunday. And then she's been going home and she's been telling her mom how good church is. She's been moithering her mom to come to church. Uh, and on Sunday, her mom came to church. Uh, and what happened was this little girl, she was in the kids' work, which my wife leads. Um, and my wife invites these children to, to pray out loud, um, to give thanks to God for what he's doing. This little girl, first time she's prayed, she's only been in church weeks, and she said, thank you, Jesus, that my mom is in church today. How, how, how good is that? Um, and we had a barbecue, we had a barbecue straight after church, we were really building community, so much life uh, in Wolverhampton. And her mom and daughter came to that barbecue and she was the one of the last to leave. So we're praying, you know, God's at work there and she'll be back. We've been going just over a, a year now in person. Uh, and in that year, um, we've seen people come to faith at the end of last year, the last Sunday in December. Oh, this is such a, we baptized four people, four brand new Christians uh, that come to faith. Guys, God is on the move and it is a privilege to serve this movement. Amen. Come on. I love this. This just feels like a massive celebration, just getting to hear some of these stories. And the next step from what we're hearing is the next priority, developing leaders. So on that note, I'm going to invite Steve Kempton to come and join me. Let's give him a massive round of applause as he joins us. So Steve, you've got a bit of an international context. 
as well as a UK context. I do, So yes. what can you bring from your church planting experience and developing leaders overseas here to the UK and what can we do as part of that? It's a really big chasm, isn't it, when you see something overseas and then you think, you know, how can it happen back in the UK? And uh, again, we're all giving a little bit of a context. I, with my wife Helen, went to Nepal in 2007 and we worked with a fantastic fellow called Bob Garley and uh, we are great friends and it was a, it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, and in that time, um, Bob uh, had a real vision for, for Nepal, which was one trained leader in every village. It was very simple. Uh, the challenge was that there's 28,000 villages and it's, it's a little bit of, of a big ask. And so we started with very little, not a lot, and just ourselves. Um, and you can go into all the details, but the reality is just, you know, all of that time later, 13 years later, there's, there's over 200 churches there now planted uh, through, through the, the methodology that we kind of grew into through, uh, you know, different kind of ways. We, we journeyed, we, we tried to do all kinds of things. We failed a lot uh, and uh, we succeeded a lot. And we, 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 we tried to develop um, a program where we could really raise up leaders or church planters to be able to do that work and 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 that was really exciting to see and what i what i wanted to, to maybe share with you is just that whole concept of developing uh, leaders i think it's really really i think it's really key and the way i want to do it is by talking about hardware and software uh, something that we would probably all kind of imagine that we know something about leadership is not just about um developing tools and gifts in people's lives. We've all probably got John Maxwell books about how to do this and what's this and how to do the mechanics, you know, strategy, communication, vision, all of those kind of things that really happen in corporates as well. It's stuff that you think, yeah, no, that's the, the, these are the kind of hardware kind of, uh, kind of uh, things that you need in order to, to do leadership. And they're key and they're really important. But what I found is, and what's unique to the Christian ministry is the software part. Uh, and this is what we kind of really drilled into, uh, in, uh, both in, uh, in Nepal and in, in Cambodia, and also where I am in, in, in Western Supermare. Because uh, leadership longevity uh, really begins in recognizing that software of things like character and humility and integrity and motives. Why we do what we do and who we're serving and what is service. It's really interesting if anyone uses the King James Bible. Anyone use the King James Bible? You know, not many, of, not many of us, I use it now and again. It's interesting that in the King James Bible, that the word leadership or leader is only used three times. It's only used three times. And there's, there's a lot about leadership and leader, leader, leader. And it's really important that we have leaders. But actually, it's really, it's really interesting to me that it's only mentioned three times. In fact, it doesn't say Moses, my leader. It says Moses, my servant. Moses, my servant. That was the first priority that Moses was. He was a servant. And I think it's really interesting, again, in the life of Jesus, when we talk about leadership, and again, we would talk to all our church planters, and we would talk about what kind of leader uh, are we looking to become. Um, because even Jesus, even though we all believe that he was the best leader in the world, never used the word leader of himself. Never said, I'm a leader. But by the fact that people followed him, People assume that he was a leader. Such was the influence, and that's what leadership is, isn't it? It's influence, and that's what we get to, to bring upon people's lives. And Jesus had no congregation in that sense that followed him. He had no platform, and yet he was the king of kings, and he had no reputation, no beauty to draw us to him in that sense. And it gives us a different understanding of what is leadership. In fact, the leadership roll call for Jesus probably was Philippians 2, which we all will know very well. He goes down and not up. It's the kind of countercultural kind of concept of uh, up there, you know, and yet it's actually, it was down there that in the software part, in the inner man, in the inner person that we wanted to instill in our leaders, that that's what makes longevity, not just the tools that we've got it, whatever we think it is. It's all about him having us unreservedly. God doesn't want the 95% that we've given him. He wants the 5% that we've kept. He wants us. And so in that kind of drilling down of leadership and 
what it means and Jesus humbled himself, there's this transition. You know, is there an east and west? Is there something that you know you do in the West that you can't be done in the East? But I find that the Bible transcends culture. Because the Bible really is, wherever the culture is, is transformative, wherever it is. And it's the truth that it sets people free. And the, 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 the one scripture that I, I, I find, and there are many that kind of correlates to both and any, any kind of sphere or hemisphere where we are. And I find it a really exciting scripture that is often not used or undervalued in many ways, and it's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It's really easy to remember, it's 2.2.2. 2, 2. You could just take it away with you, you can have that. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. and it's Paul writing to Timothy saying, and the things that I've taught you, the things you have heard from me, entrust to reliable men and women. I think that's really, really important. We wanted to entrust, and I want you to imagine like a big bag of diamonds in a, in a velvet bag and, 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 and you see the Apostle Paul giving this bag of diamonds to Timothy saying, I'm entrusting this to you. It's the gospel. It's a value that you cannot comprehend. Don't, don't add to it. Don't take from it. It's really significant. I am in, God is entrusting to us as leaders the gospel. It's incredibly valuable. But not only does he entrust to us, he says, now... He says, I want you to pass it on to reliable. And here we are with regards to leadership in whatever sphere. We need reliable leaders, don't we? What, what does the word reliable mean to you? And I, I try to think about when we used to do training in Nepal, uh, you know, what, what is reliable? That people can be trusted with the gospel. That people, you know, the software is in place with regards to character and integrity. And these are the things that you don't learn in the book you only learn that in a room with Jesus. The deep down who you are becoming, who you are in the dark, who you are when no one else is watching. Those are the really important elements that you want to instill. And you can only instill that by living that yourself. It really is important. If you go to Nepal, you will find that most of the church planters, I'll be there next week and there'll be 50 of us gathering. You know, all of, all of them are friends of mine, but the, the first thing that they will offer to do, most of them, is that they will wash feet. They'll wash feet because every time we went to a village, a Hindu village, a Muslim village, a Buddhist village, whatever we did leadership training, we would always start by the greatest way that we could in order to show what true leadership was, which is service. Service. And even now, people in Nepal remember that as a vivid example. We didn't do it for show. It was part of who we are to demonstrate who Jesus was. What does it mean to be reliable? I think be, be, be reliable to stay in the shadows. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about my ministry. It's about Jesus taking center stage. And we wanted our church planters to always know that they had a gift. The gifts of God are irrevocable. But the character is what brings longevity and multiplication. And this is the thing about 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It's the key to church planting and discipleship. Because it's where multiplication happens to a degree that we have no idea. I'm from a council estate in Sheffield. I know who I am. I left school with no qualifications. My friends used to say to me that I was as thick as two short planks. And I was. That's the end. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I had eight minutes and, and it's already gone. So uh, the, transferable, the transferable part of this is, you know, it's seeing all of those great things happen, you think, how does it happen in the, in the West? I think a lot of it is by example, and it's, uh, it's by coming alongside others and the team in Western Supermare who are here today. You know, I'm really proud of them, young leaders who are, who are, who are seeking to lead by example. But, you know, that's what I, that's what I want to share with you. Uh, I would share a lot more, but there you go, that's time. But God bless you, anyway. Thank you. <laughs> I think if you get time today, I know obviously we're all gonna be very busy fellowshipping and having coffees with people, but if you get time, even when you go back to your room this evening, just meditate on 2 Timothy 2.2 2 and Philippians 2, because humility, it has to be the foundation of everything that we do. Jesus' humility, I mean, when we spend time in his presence, when we worship him, it has to shape us. It has to form who we are and what we're doing. Um, and so on that note, I would like to invite up one of the most humble leaders I think I've ever met in my life, uh, Barima Diallo. 
we've given Barima a little bit longer to share with us because he's joining us from West Africa and there are so many stories and we could never fit them all into eight minutes. And so with everyone who shared today, I, they don't know I'm going to say this, but grab them at lunch, grab them around, ask them more details, but over to you, Barima, what's going on? And we'd love to hear your heart. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you. And I'm wondering oh, how am I going to do if a British man couldn't keep you for time? How am I coming from Africa? <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, okay. okay, okay, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. Yeah, yeah, I'll try. Thank you. So my name is Buraima. I'm from Burkina Faso in uh, West Africa, in uh, the place where it always sounds, uh, the sun is sunny. So please, when you feel cold, come to Burkina. It'll be a bit warmer. So what we do in Burkina Faso in West Africa, that's the question I'm due to ask in less than eight minutes now. And uh, by the grace of God, I was a Muslim, and now I'm a follower of Jesus. And uh, what we do is to make disciples amongst the Muslims and equip them to reach out to Muslims. That's what we are doing in West Africa, basically. And how do we do it? It is through prayer. I think our first speaker at the, opening, at the opening of this convention here has mentioned the importance of prayer. Grasping in the spiritual world that reality and bringing it down to us. It is intentional prayer, living the life of prayer. You know, as former Muslims and also Muslims, we pray. But how do you redeem that energy? Redeeming prayer. People pray at least five times a day. But when you disciple those former Muslims, how do you redeem prayer to encourage them to intentionally pray for transformation of their lives, of their communities, and also purposing them to reach out to nations? So that's part of the training that we provide in uh, prayer. And also, we equip those former Muslims, I would say Christians, let me use the word, you know, that we are discipling in uh, skills for self-reliance, and we call that access ministry. What do we do when we are training people? We are training them in skills so that they may be able to access the communities to legitimize their presence in the community. Let's say if you arrive in a Muslim community with your Bible, you are here to tell you about Jesus, it's great, but if you arrive with a trade or a skill, you will be better accepted than arriving with your Bible. And also know that for most people who are coming from the Islamic background, you are most often rejected. You lose almost everything. So therefore, as a disciple amongst the Muslims, you need to have an open house, enough food, enough shelter to welcome people, to equip them, and also to equip them with a trade so that they may be able to suffice themselves and then to access communities. So we train people in tailoring. What I'm wearing has been produced by church planters, and most of those have never touched a machine in their lives. But for three to six months, we equip them. Some choose to do tailoring. We train also people in doing restaurant work, food hygiene, and selling food. We train people also in doing a hairdressing or barber, barber, you know, and we train them in uh, uh, operating grinding machines. We train them in uh, those skills in such a way that when they arrive in their communities, they don't arrive as pastors, teachers, prophets, or bishops, even though these functions are needed, but they arrive as service providers. And through their service now, they connect with people of peace. They connect, and that's very important according to Luke 10, Matthew 10. They connect with people of peace, and they disciple with these people of peace. And with a coaching of me or others who have sent them. The coaching is very important as they are out there. And then they connect with people of peace. And the people of peace open up their houses, open up their communities. It's all coming from within, from the inside out. And then that leads to the discovery Bible studies that we call, like uh, opening of a Bible. And people are learning to discover and are questioning the Bible. You know, when people come from Islam, they are really full of questions. They want to know. 
So don't set yourself as the answer provider, but let them discover for themselves, entrusting the Holy Spirit to convince them. You know, that's the way we are proceeding. It is slow process, but it goes deep, and it is transformational. And through that, we see people, people coming to Christ, that uh, we are discipling, and then also we are identifying, at the same time, emerging leaders from within the group. What we call it emerging leader is those people from the group who are participating in the Discovery Bible study and who are applying the committed learning. Because at the end of every Discovery Bible study, there is an intentional commitment to do together something during the week and to give a feedback the following session of the following week. That's the way we operate. And watch out for those who are doing that and equip them more to do more. For these are the agent, the local agent of transformation in the community. These are the good newses of the uh, community. And by doing so, by the way, you who is the purse of a pioneer church planting in the community, you are working yourself out of a job. And it's very important yeah. to equip local leaders and then to exit and to become a coach. So all of this is happening from within. And it's very important to do that. And also, by the grace of God, I think your time is off. That's good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, you may need to put it on again, sorry. Uh, yeah. And, uh, sorry, you turned off by yourself. <laughs> okay, so, and uh, one of the things that we do in uh, seeing those emerging leaders developed is to encourage them to replicate, to go out and to find people of peace as well, and to do likewise. So, we then have generational disciples that are growing within the community. So, this is our process of doing it, and it's trusting God for fruit, trusting God that those who are discipled are also discipling by the grace of God. And uh, now, I, I just got short time, but I want to say to you, like for this year, for over 10 to 12 years now, we have been doing that in, by the grace of God in uh, Burkina Faso and in 13 other countries now in Africa. And in Burkina Faso alone, for instance, this year, we have got 123 people that we are training in level one. It, all these are former Muslims. And in level two, we have got 49. When we say level one, level one is for those who have never ever had the training. Sometimes there are new disciples that are being trained, all right? Now for level two, it is people who have the level one training who have gone and have started a discovery Bible study or have planted a church that qualifies you for level two. Yeah. It's not uh, just because you have done level one, you are qualified for level two, but it has to be verified yeah. that you have got a active discovery Bible study and also that you have planted a church, you have baptized. Just uh, a few weeks ago, we baptized seven people in our little church in the village. So that is happening in the Muslim world. Somebody wrote a book, Wind in the half of, House of Islam. And I would like to say that this is true, it is happening. Another thing that we do is to make sure that the DNA is right. That that is going on in every church, in every community, and also in the movement that we are seeing happen. That the DNA is making disciples, all right? Developing leaders, like we say here in Elam, you know, and uh, planting churches. It's very important for us to do that and reaching out to nations and making sure that everyone who is coming to the group is actively praying for someone. He's actively reaching out. He's actively making disciples. And we encourage people to have at least 30 people that we are praying for. The number 30, we just chose it lightly, not magic, but by the way, to just get people to pray. And now, when one of the people become a follower of Christ, you have got 29, so you replace again with another person. So you can make your list around you. You need to have prayer, active prayer. And uh, in the community, what, what we do, it is a trust that we are salt and light. What is she? <laughs> okay, <laughs> but is, is it time? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And we look 
reluctant to stop you. Oh, okay. But Sorry, carry, you yeah. tell this story and then we'll uh, go, we'll okay, go okay. to next. So I will skip that story and tell you this. Uh, yeah. And here is just a real life story as well. Abdullah, he came to Christ, not through this way of doing, but God, Jesus, appeared to him. And the vision, if this is happening in the Muslim world, he decided to follow Christ. And he was met by one of our church planters. But his community abandoned him. He was a shopkeeper. He had the biggest shop in his village. But suddenly, because of his decision to follow Christ, he became the poorest of the poor in the village and rejected. And for Africans, it's so difficult. Community matters, but he had no more community. So he was discipled by Hamid, one of our church planters. And now, by the grace of God, Abdullah is a church planter. Not only that, he has developed church planters, and he's the regional coordinator, not by nomination, but because he has planted so many churches in his coaching people, and this is happening. We thank God. Amazing. Prima, I, 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 uh, Prima, I could listen to you all day, and your stories, and what God is doing through you, amazing. Uh, really, just amazing. Uh, what, what Barima didn't tell you is that in 13 years, they have now sent church planters into 13 countries. Um, 13 years. Thousands of people have been released into mission. The thing that strikes me about the stories that we've heard is the call, the call is primarily to a person, not to a thing. The call is to follow Jesus, to wherever he sends and to whomever he sends. The question is not if you're called, or if you're sent, the question is, to where are you sent? And the other thing that stands and strikes me about the stories that we've heard is that prayer always precedes fruitful mission. But mission always fuels prayer. See, Jesus has to have preeminence. There's only room for one priority. There's only room for one Lord. So would you stand with me in the presence of Jesus? I'm going to read a scripture and then we're going to sing and use, this so use this so these songs to respond. You might want to just do some business with Jesus as you've heard these stories. But this is not about model. What we've done today is deliberately sh shown a, a variety of approaches. But we've wanted to show you what it looks like to follow Jesus into every community, into every nation. He, this is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything, not some things, but everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, have been created through him and for him. All things. Not some things. All things. He is before all things. Not some things. All things. And by him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning, the, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. First place. Preeminence. Our first priority. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and to reconcile to him, to reconcile everything to himself everything not just some things everything whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross this is the jesus in whom we serve this is the jesus in whom we are a representative and ambassador into our communities it's all about jesus